Um, yes, my, my interest is, is um, actually more about tracing ritual healing into the distant past. And there's a sort of second part of this, which used to be the first part that was earlier, um, which looks at prehistoric past. But this is the medieval past, which I find um, quite um, soothing in some ways, because there's good, as we've seen, good historical documentation. Yet, in that medieval past, we also find that medicine and, and medics, medical practitioners, are ambivalent. They are today. They can both cure and kill. And whether that's volitional is a subject of law. And so today we have laws to both protect the practitioner from things that go wrong, but also to protect the person that's receiving the treatment, the patient. And these are relatively recent phenomena. And of course, today, they're, when they go wrong, they're the subject of very salacious newspaper headlines. Um, Jeffrey Chaucer is a wonderful source. Um, why? He's a very dispassionate observer. He just tells you. And he, he doesn't judge, but he shows. And that's a wonderful thing as a, as a, as a person who tries to teach. I try to show and not tell. Telling is sort of, uh, it's not very much fun. And so, and this is an interesting, remember that the, the Canterbury Tales is about a group of uh, pilgrims that are going on what is a normal sort of pilgrimage in the spring to Canterbury. And they're going to visit the Holy Bristol Martyr, Thomas Beckett, his grave, his shrine. Um, which seems a strange way to perhaps um, talk about um, practitioners, but it's, it's fundamental because it's popular piety. And in popular piety was a whole series of notions about how to cure, how to treat, and also how to protect from affliction. Okay? But affliction could be physical, mental, right? it, it could be just somebody thinking ill of somebody else. Okay? And in an academia, heady environment of academia, thinking ill of somebody else is often some a real challenge. <laughs> um, so Beckett <laughs> murdered okay, in the cathedral by noblesse oblige, a King Henry who says, I wish that damn priest were dead. And that's all he had to do. He didn't have to pick up a sword or anything. And four, and actually they're not nobodies, they're, they're four knights set out to kill Beckett. What's interesting about this is they all are landholders. Beckett is their liege lord. And so they have various <laughs> grudges with the archbishop okay, that predate his being archbishop. Okay, he was a military person before. He was chancellor. He had the purse strings. But he had his own company of knights that raised havoc in the south of France for a period of time. So he's, he's quite a formidable figure. But the important thing here is social status. What is Beckett's flaw in the eyes of many medieval observers? He's a social climber. He's born in the middle of London okay, to probably uh, craftsmen. He's, a, he's the rising middle class. And he becomes educated because he's a clever boy. He's also quite a tall man and, and considered to be nice looking. But he's a social climber. He becomes chancellor because he's good with money. He's good at making it for himself. And it, so it's, it's a quite an interesting social status intercuts all these other aspects. What does that mean? Today, we have organs that, um, well, he's not, well, yes, bodies that permit access to medicine, treatment. That's the big problem. In the medieval past, they could treat people, but not everybody had access. In fact, the small minority had access. In the distant prehistoric past, we think probably they had even less access. I'm not certain. I wonder if they had more. It's just that the, 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 the results were perhaps, perhaps not as we would see as medicinally effective. Because we have very fixed ideas about this. And of course, in the world today, this is still a big question. You know, are faith healers really doing anything? Okay. And there are people and professionals who say, yes, they are. And then some will say, but do they really heal? Well, sometimes it helps. Is that, is that good enough? Okay. Um, so this is Beckett being killed. The basic chop is the top of his head off. Okay. Four blows, 
delivered by these guys. And the, the, the blood spills on the floor. What's weird about that is people come running. They know something's going on. There's a commotion. And they come running with bits and pieces of cloth and clothing, and they dip it in the blood, the spattered blood brains on the floor. Why? It's the source of healing. That gets blood, creates miraculous healing. And of course, he, after that event, becomes very quickly canonized. It's one of the quickest canonizations. You know, it's about three years. Um, and it's Thomas, to the St. Thomas's Hospital, it's a very common name. It's from him. Okay. Uh, but he's actually killed, a murderer. Okay. Uh, and he's canonized, made a saint. He becomes a cult figure. That's his shrine, actually, here. That was once in Canterbury Cathedral. But these little badges are this basically his life. It's like Christ's life. It's like the, um, the Stations of the Cross sort of thing. Okay. So very common um, medieval um, ideas about this. His clothing, like in Tulane here, it's his cloak, also become dating treasures. Okay. And even just being close to a saint was good enough. And again, if you think about, very few people will, will try to crawl inside a coffin with a body today. But here, they made a little hole. This is not Beckett's tomb, but we know that they did similar things. They would try to touch the remains and as close as possible, intimate contact, okay, to cure of affl affliction. Okay? Now, Medieval medicine is quite a, and this is, uh, there are medical historians that can do this far better than I, but the key thing to remember here is that you have a physicus, or sometimes called medicus, and a barber surgeon. Let's say that you, well, you had, for some reason, damaged your hand, and you were going to get an amputation like this, see? You wouldn't go to a physicus. You would go to the barber surgeon. The barber surgeon is the practitioner. The physicist explained this. He's a physician, but at that time, they didn't treat. Okay? Now, explain they, they, they used different kinds of treatment. Okay? This is what Chaucer says about the doctor of physic. And he says, it'd be strange, he says, he keeps his patients in full great deal in hours by his natural magic. Okay? This is one of the most interesting passages from that okay, text. Um, mag natural magic. What's natural magic? Okay. Well, in a medieval sense, and this is where the treatment comes in. These little things here, found in Exeter Cathedral, they're little waxen figures. This is a, a horse's hoof. This is a person's face, their hand and their feet. Okay. Some of you that study Roman material will know about votive offerings made by Romans at right? cult sites. This is similar. They would go in and hang these on the shrines, okay? But also, the physicus would read the stars to hang them on the body, the part of the body that was afflicted. And that was treatment, okay? Um, and this is quite, quite curious. Um, the, the problem with this is, is there's almost nothing regular. So there, there's no, there, no, there's no uh, sort of medical association. This is early forms are in France, in fact. Okay? Late medieval and early modern. So there's no control over this. You sought med medical treatment and medical care where you could. Okay. Already, yes. Hmm, okay. Anyway, one of the things that he, he, he knows, the, the, the physicist, is he, he knows his texts. And Chaucer does this wonderful medieval thing. You see Avicenna here, Galen, and old Hippocrates. So he knows his texts. Okay. The barber surgeon. And this is fast. I pulled this one out because um, Paracelsus is from, from Basel, in Basel. And one of the important things about him is he's an irascible character. But basically, he spends a lot of his time burning books because he says they're useless. Well, he's burning the same books that the, the doctor of physics was reading. And instead, he treats people by chemistry and, and natural remedies, he calls it. These are things borrowed from people sometimes called cunning women or men. These were people in the community that knew how to heal. Okay. Um, Ambrose Palais is one of the most famous barber surgeons, and, and he's amongst those barber surgeons, many were military. Okay. They had to treat things now. 
There's no hanging wax and figures. Okay? People are bleeding to death. And he's responsible for all kinds of uh, medical treatments, including, for example, how to help the birth of a child that's, that's in breech position. So it's practical, practical knowledge. Okay? He's rare, um, Palais, because he wrote. And most of them probably didn't. We, we don't have any text from them, but they treated. We have their treatments. Okay? I'm just going to look at one, because I've used too much of my time already. Um, it's already published, so you don't even have to pay attention if you don't want to. Um, but this is a site called Fishergate in the city of York in northern England. It's a Gilbertine monastery. The Gilbertines, um, they're basically a, a branch, if you will, of the Cistercians. And the Cistercians are famous for their waterworks and things. They're technically very gifted. And there are two individuals that come from this site. And if you, if you can see, this is, excuse me, this is an old blue prom slide. But there are 13 individuals towards the, towards the right side of the presbytery. That's the same number of the original canons that were here. Okay? Um, and this, this is, so this is the so-called ecclesiastical cemetery. And in there is this. Aligned with it. This is really fascinating because the second skeleton that obeys the first is a woman. It's a female. And she was clearly buried afterwards. And if you know, this, this individual the, this is a male, the one behind her. You note that his right lower limb is kind of bowed like this. His right upper limb is straight like that. And it's very rare at this side. They're, they're more like the normal sort of hands on the pelvis or mm -hmm. chest. Well, his knee looks like that. That's the tibia. And it, it's, it's, I cannot capture this in film, probably because I'm not very good at it. Um, but this is a, it is very green, it's green. So this, this is a disruptive, maybe not this problem, and you hear, and it's treated with these plates that were recovered. Okay? You saw some pictures of hernia belts in Eliana's uh, presentation. This is another one of these treatments. There were people that knew how to do this. Okay? And they're actually reading text, but not the ones that Chaucer's doctor was listing. <coughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> They're reading things like this, the old Hippocrates, the Hippocratic corpus. And, um, and again, this is quite curious. It's, it's using sort of what I might call blacksmith's materials. So they take shackles, like metal things, and you make circlets to stabilize an unstable joint. Okay. Why is the other one <coughs> like that? Maybe because there was something wooden here to help it move. Um, but this is evidence that there was somebody reading those texts and actually then treating. But note, Gilbertine, monastic, he's an older male, okay, probably entered late in life, sort of retirement, and that woman could possibly very likely have been his wife. Okay. These are things that could be tested now with DNA and things like that, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, <laughs> But this is, again, this, this is a really nice example that what we are tr tracing are practices. Um, there's no very little writing from barber surgeons, okay? but it's quite act they were quite active. This is my last slide then. And I just want to, this is a priest. This is a priest? I know it's a priest. He's buried at the mortuary chalice in Patton. Look at his lower limbs. You say, well, where's the rest of it? Beneath the high altar, he basically embedded. They couldn't excavate it because he's beneath the high altar in a in a, in a chapel. He served a hospital. Okay. If you look at the, the right lower limb, you know that the foot is turned laterally, yeah. and it's it's smaller. It's, it's less robust. Okay. Um, this is a slipidiphysis, and that's what you. This is an untreated one. Okay. You're actually looking at somebody that had this bilateral. I was repaired. But it's hell to get out of these seats now that I'm in older <laughs> years. Um, but this is curious. He's a priest buried in a hospital, St. Giles. He was called the St. Giles priest by the executive when he looked at him in the lab. Giles, another name associated with hospitals. What's curious about that is Giles is a saint that was wounded in the leg by hunting. One has to wonder. Was this person selected because he had this affliction, but also because he understood what it was like 
to live with a hip. What, what happens to people that have that? They basically have a short limb. They walk like this. You can do it without a, a crutch, but it's exhausting. And just to say again, state is, is really interesting. So Hestus would have been impaired, considered disabled in the sense that he's associated with Giles. But clearly, there's some kind of other part where because he was afflicted, perhaps he could help others. And that's what one of the definitions of the priest was. Okay. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but just the, the, the last comment to make is that this idea that medical people and medical practice is ambivalent is really important, especially in the prehistoric past when we don't have the text. Okay. They're as much feared by some as loved by others. Okay. Um, and I'll leave that for your imagination. Thank you.